you're Michael Beinhorn. Uh, like many people that are that are behind the scenes, uh, <laughs> people know your work, but they don't necessarily know your name. And so, uh, real quick, tell us about who you are uh, and what you do. Well, Michael Beinhorn, born in Forest Hills, Queens. Uh, I started out as a uh, fine art student, went into illustration, somehow bought a synthesizer because I was obsessed with sound from the time I was very young and fell quite by accident into music production. And that's where I've pretty much remained ever since I was about 21 in some form or another. And I've worked with artists from Herbie Hancock to the Red Hot Chili Peppers to Soundgarden to Marilyn Manson, Korn. Uh, and uh, I've kind of taken a bit of an interesting turn over the past 10 years and moved even further behind the scenes to explore avenues of production and music making that I feel have been left by the wayside but are extremely important to the process, actually indispensable to the process of music production. I'm gonna dive into that, but hold on just a second. Oh yeah, that pesky door, right? We'll have a continuity issue. And then the next thing will happen is my cat will start to scratch at it and make noise and I'll have to go let the cat <laughs> in. Um, but, so let's dive into what you just talked about. These, uh, <clears throat> this other aspect that you think is indispensable that has maybe not been given the attention because that was something I wanted to ask you about anyway. Right, well, um, <laughs> I think over the past 20 years, there's been a marked shift in the process of music production. And a lot of it has really become process and gear oriented. And it's a lot less listening oriented and uh, it's a lot less conceptual, uh, which to me makes it less of an artistic pursuit. So it doesn't have the same kind of resonance that it used to have, I feel personally, in the process of music making and record making. And one of the things that's been lost over time is the process of pre-production. Another is artist development. Now, these are two things that I feel are indispensable to making a record because artists don't necessarily, they don't grow, grow in a vacuum and they don't just come out of the womb fully formed. And this is a misconception that I think a lot of people have. You know, they, they're not just made, they're created, they're developed. Every great artist that one listens to that has any kind of career trajectory or, um, I guess, legacy grew over time. You know, you can go, I, I, one extreme case of this is a guy like David Bowie, who was so brilliant at it that he really sort of developed himself. He just was the same guy over decades, but he just kept evolving and trying on different masks and seeing which one he wanted to use for this recording or group of recordings. Uh, but every great artist, from Billie Holiday to the Beatles, to Miles Davis, to Bob Dylan, it's you know, Bruce Springsteen, et cetera, et cetera. All these people began someplace. They weren't fully formed. They were developed over time. Another aspect of the process is pre-production. You know, the time that goes into actually assembling a body of work that's going to be recorded for an album, changing parts, listening, you know, sifting through the songs, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And that's especially important to the process, what doesn't work. A lot of people now have thrown these things to the wayside, by the wayside. And the reason for that is that they simply take up too much time. And that time is basically time that's lost by people who are earning money from the process of producing records. If, you want, if you're producing a record, basically you wanna see a band with 10 to 12 songs that you're gonna record fast, get it done, in, out, boom, 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 because people aren't spending a lot of money making records now. And 
I guess concurrent with that, recording technology is pretty ubiquitous, so it's available to everyone. And you, anyone can make a record, which gives people this false impression that it's incredibly easy to do this. And from a superficial standpoint, it's never been easier. But in terms of the actual guts, in terms of making a recording that's going to stand the test of time, or even have any kind of lasting value for a rel relatively short amount of time, this takes work. It takes effort. And again, for a record producer, it's not a it's not really a, a, as much of a consideration anymore to spend time with an artist. If an artist comes to you now with a budget of like $40,000 to make a record, you're going to look at that and go, how am I going to take the $40,000 and make the record? You know, you're going to start thinking about what aspects of the recording process you get to strip away. First thing that's going to go is pre-production. Normally that's a process that could take months, you know? Um, so for the, let me stop you there for the, because I want to dive into the nuts and bolts of making an album and what is normal maybe now and what, you know, you would like to see changed. And so I think key to that is making sure the people watching have an understanding of the terms we're using in the process. So let's start with, because I think this happens first and ongoing throughout an artist's career, right? Uh, what exactly do you mean by artist development? Yeah, well, I should have been more clear about that. And, Sorry. Uh Artist development is essentially the process where you take the raw material, the artist, and give them the opportunity to kind of evolve, you know, to become what it is that they're going to be. I think that the process has become something now. There still is what's called artist development, but it's largely not an organic process, whereas before I think it was really we wanted to see who this person was going to become on their own. Now it's kind of like, you know, you got to get your hair a certain way. You have to brand yourself and market yourself a certain way on social media. That's artist development. But really, yeah, it that's has what I was going to say. Sorry to, to yeah. interrupt. I was going to say now, at least in my outsider's view, it seems that artist development might be more centered on the outward branding and marketing versus yeah. previously artist development is more about what's the soul of this artist who is this person on an artistic yeah. level outside of the audience or any individual recording or anything like that yeah now it's the most superficial elements of an artist like appearance it doesn't even have to do with the music as much um which is very interesting because ultimately it's the music that's going to determine whether or not the public's going to like them or not right you know, uh, so that's really what artist development comes down to. In the past, you would have people developing artists who would look at every single aspect of what the artist was doing, including the appearance in some cases, but mainly like what's the type of music that you're playing? What are you doing? Who are you? What are these songs? You know, how can, and it would be a creative process of trying to focus an artist and get them to start evolving in a natural way. People would like to refer back to the Beatles. And I think I think a lot of people still use this model as a way to develop artists. That's like throwing an art, throwing a band in a van and just having them tour back and forth over the across the United States for maybe a year and make that be sort of like the process of them coming into themselves and you know developing. But they don't really consider the fact that they're basing that on one band who happened to become incredibly successful by going to Germany right. and playing like, you know, three gigs a week every day, seven days a week for like, you know, two years. Right. They had a pretty long uh, time to develop that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a long time, but also these guys were hyper talented. I mean, they, they had abilities beyond normal mortals. Anyway, you can't expect that that same process is going to work that it's kind of like a system that you can just imprint on every single artist or group of artists. Everyone needs their own group of variables, their own process to be able to develop or just kickstart the process. Got it. So yeah, so artist development is more is, is about the soul of the artist. They're, you know, what are they trying to communicate? Why are they doing this in the first place? Yeah. Um, sort of what's their vibe, so to speak. And then um, and so that's that's just whole worldview of the artists themselves. Then pre-production, uh, by contrast, is the building on that, right? But focus on a specific set of recordings that eventually will become an album. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, and everyone approaches it differently if they do it at all, which as I was indicating before is something that doesn't happen as much now. So what uh, would pre-production look like, you know, if you could in your mind do it right, so to speak? Well, in the past, when I've worked with artists, I would start by listening to their songs. That's obviously the most logical place. And that gives me a bearing of what I'm going to be working with, how I can find my place in the project, what the artists need, what they've already got enough of, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, how can we build on this, what's the record going to sound like, what songs are great, what songs aren't, what songs do they need? Uh, you know, who's the strongest in the band? Who's the weakest? You know, how can we bring everyone to the same level? What are what are we going to need to get the right kinds of performances out of the artists? Uh, and so on. So that's, you know, that that's really where the process begins for me. And it, as I was indicating before, it can be a fairly long, drawn out process. On some records I've worked on, pre-production's gone on for a couple of weeks and some others it's been two months. I worked on one where it took seven months before we actually got into a studio and began recording. So it's all relative. But so you're you're really getting to know the artist at a at a deep level, you know, from their grand their talent. Level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel that that's one of the most important phases of the project. Really, in some respects, it's no less important than the actual recording. Because without it, you're really rolling the dice on what the outcome is going to be. This is basically an insurance policy. You're ensuring that no matter what happens, you're going to get the very best out of this artist at this point in time. Whatever they're able to deliver at this point in time, you will get the best of it. Unless they're resistant and push back, in which case they shouldn't be making a record in the first place. Right. Well, and there's a part of it that is um, makes sense just mm -hmm. at at a surface level, right? The more you know about, you know, their repertoire, the the talent of the people, you know, what they put out there, you know, what what you've got coming in to work with, that that makes sense to anyone, you know, on you know why it would make a your job easier or a record better. But I can I would also imagine that a part of that is just that relationship building process that would occur during that process because you are you are going to be challenging them right you're going to be making decisions you know with them for them um you know about a thing that matters a whole lot to the artist right especially if it's their first album or they're you know the last of a dozen and so i would imagine having to establish that process that working relationship if you will is a lot of the value of that time in addition to just the core research and you uh you know becoming familiar with the artist yeah exactly that comes over time and you know being in the position of producer <clears throat> and in the position that i take on you will have to challenge the artist and in doing that you kind of have to prove yourself to the artist so you have to bring to them you have to bring to them a perspective, pardon me, that they wouldn't have otherwise had and show them things in their music that you're finding that they haven't, they haven't seen, you know, to give them your perspective and to present it in a way where they feel safe, they feel protected, they feel that they're not being attacked in any way. You know, over time, uh, I, I, I realized that the way that I was approaching people was a little bit too vigorous. And, uh, you know, I had to, I had to develop a technique for being able to talk to people and understand that when I was doing this, you know, I wasn't just sharing with them a vital information that I needed to know. I was basically criticizing them about their art. This is a very, very slippery, slippery topic. It's, it, it can be potentially fraught with a lot of difficulties. Because, you know, you're getting into a, into a situation with people you don't know. And the first thing that among the first conversations you're going to be having with them is telling them about how some of their work isn't quite up to the level that it needs to be. Or it needs, or it needs to change like. in a certain way. And yeah, you don't know what they're talking yeah. to. Yeah. You don't know what that looks like. You don't know what they're going, what they're going to react to and how they're going to react. 
you also know that you've got a job to do. So you're going to have to walk into this minefield somewhat unprepared and bring all your skills and your abilities to the fore. So if you don't know how to talk to people when you're doing this, it can become extremely difficult and you can get a lot of pushback. But if you do, while the conversations can be uncomfortable at times, you're able to frame it in a way where the artist understands that this isn't being said to hurt their feelings, that it's not coming as an attack, that you're on their side, you're on their team, they've hired you to help them, and this is how you do it, and this is what you're doing for them, that this is your service to them. It's not always going to be you're great, you're great, you're great. I think a lot of people do approach record production that way, and I'm sure to a great extent that that, that technique works for them, but I've never seen that um, resulting in anything good. Uh, I wouldn't do that with an artist. I do. I, I find it very hard to control myself when I'm excited about something, uh, you know, which I think is great. If you're enthusiastic, it helps. And the inability to control that also shows the artist and the people you're working with that you're genuine, that you really mean what you say, you know, uh, and it's also fun to get excited, enthusiastic and excited about stuff. But, you know, that gets tempered by the honesty of critique, you know. So, yeah, it's a whole it's a very it's it's a fascinating process, because hopefully by the time you get into the recording studio with the artist, you forge the bond. There's an understanding there and there's a desire, an open desire for for there to be like a really great collaborative process that takes place. Yeah, I, I was an art student student in college and we had six hour critique classes and uh, you bring in your work and it was in the morning, it was 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And uh, you would bring in your work, put it up on the wall and then your 25 other uh, fellow classmates would rip it apart and uh and including the, the teacher and you got used to criticism really quickly and mm -hmm. you learned to not necessarily attach yourself to the art as much um and to accept that external voice right to say huh. yeah i made these i made these decisions and you know i thought they were 100 the best at the time but now i've got other input and let's see what i can do and it was an interesting process for me to look at because you're in life, you're you're always getting that sort of input, right? You you know you you come out with a plan, you think it's the the best plan, and then you know you get punched in the face, as you know to paraphrase. Um, so that that ability to you know, especially when you're working with someone like you, who you know you have the benefit uh, of your resume, right? And so there's a level of look, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, but uh, that will not necessarily trump, you know, if someone says they're right uh, and, you know, won't budge. So you have to have that it's going back to it. It's all to get back to the relationship and being able to, you took the words out of, out of my mouth that I was going to say, establish this mutual goal, the fact that you're both on the same team um, and you're trying, you're just trying to get the best product out there. Yeah, exactly. By the way, that idea of, Critiquing art students would be an inc would be absolutely phenomenal for musicians, right? Uh, yeah, that would be that would be incredible if something like that was available. That's actually been one of the one of the biggest stumbling blocks for a lot of artists I've worked with: the inability to be able to accept critique. You know how precious they are about their stuff. Which I mean, under the circumstances, I don't mean that to be a criticism. It's not. It's completely understandable, right? You know. On the topic of feedback and critique, you have recently, uh, I think it's over now, but you put up a, a on Twitter and your and, and Instagram, uh, basically a, a free service to give your thoughts on songs for people, right? So a, a musician could contact you, and you know for a limited time, you were giving sort of free feedback. Um, is that part of what we're talking about here? Is you know sort of opening opening up to you know the world of of mm -hmm. you know hearing feedback on your songs well um i haven't really thought of it in that way but uh i suppose it could serve in that sense 
Um, I've just started, I've started doing this over the past three years as kind of a, um, an offering to artists who are in need and also who aren't going to get this kind of feedback at all. It's just not going to come to them in many cases, even if they work with, with producers. Uh, and I just feel it's a great initiative to give to people and also to give back to a community that's been really supportive of me you know, over four decades, I just felt, I just feel very, I feel it's an important thing to do and it's valuable uh, to a lot of people. And uh, it creates this marvelous feedback loop. You know, I've gotten, I, I'm giving back and it all comes back around. It's great. I feel like it's, it's really kind of a, it's sort of a microcosm of what life is all about for us humans in a way. Yeah, well, and, and speaking of that critique class and you, you, that we talked about that I was in and that you know, musicians should have a, uh, access to something like that, I could see you turning that, what you're doing, into uh, you know, a monthly, almost like roundtable thing, right? Where you're sort of you know, doing it, do it for an hour and you get three or four artists involved at, you know, in, in one session um, and then you know, do it that way. So people are really not only getting your feedback, but getting feedback from other artists, but that could get even more touchy, I imagine. Oh, you've given, you've just, you've given me some great ideas already. You know, that's, that's why I, I was reflecting on that. I think it's something that would be incredibly valuable and also toughen a lot of artists up and expose them to the idea that this process isn't just about being locked in your bedroom someplace and just writing a bunch of songs, you know, with people who you know in a very in a safe little space. It's about going out into the world and being unsafe and finding situations where you kind where you sort of have to jump in and you're not really comfortable with it and you because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. I think that's a very important aspect of being an artist. And it's also something that separates people who have the potential to succeed very much from people who may be incredibly talented, but really aren't gonna do a whole lot with their talent. We've got two sort of foundational pieces, um, sort of before any artist is even in front of you, right? And we'll talk about, I know you're you're now working remotely. Um, so in front of you means different things now than it did before, but you've got <laughs> artist development, which as we talked about, sort of ongoing and more of a, a whole world look at the artist itself. Pre-production is specifically focused around an album. Uh, what happens after that? What's the next step? Well, the next step is once you've accumulated all the material for the recording and everyone's okay and happy with it. So the, it's the actual like recording process then that that's that would be the next step. Yeah. Right. When you've assembled everything, the bands rehearsed. The songs are known. Uh, we have an idea of how we're going to be recording everything. We just go, you go into the studio and start recording. And from there, it's, you know, there's so many different ways to record a project right. that it's really up to the style of music, to the people who are involved in the production, the band, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, and I think that's the part that most people, you know, we've all seen you know, videos of the Beatles and, and other people working in the studio. So sometimes it's the full band, then you're sometimes you're doing individual tracking of vocals or drums or whatever it is. And so that will change based on the the album, the the, the band, everything. Yeah. yeah. And in some cases, there's a little bit of pre-production that goes on in the in the recording studio. Uh, bands like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin, they would normally be tinkering, tinkering with songs when they went into the studio to record. You know, there wasn't really as much of a boundary line drawn between these various processes. You know, you could go into a recording studio with a song that you knew was great, but wasn't quite finished and just mess around with it. Right. Until you got it where you wanted it to be right before you recorded it. As the producer, you know, Sure, there's the there's Mike there, there's the how you do it right, but um, as a producer, when you're yeah. in the recording process with a band, what are you adding to the process? Uh, well, I definitely like to compartmentalize things and keep everything as separate as possible if I can. But 
you know, doesn't always work that way. So, uh, so there'll be little bits, as I said before, of pre-production of rearrangement, things like that, even new songs being introduced into the project that happen while the recording is taking place. Generally speaking, the recording winds up being the process of how do we physically get this into a storage medium? What's the technique we're going to use? What kind of medium are, are we going to use to record it? What kind of microphones are we going to use? Is the band going to play together? If it's a band, or are they going to do everything separately? Uh, what am I going to use to... Um, what kind of microphones am I going to use to record the vocalist? What you know? Do the band need, need some kind of, uh, I guess, enhancement or something like that to, uh, you know, to get that to get them interested, more interested in what it is that they're doing? You know, do we need mood enhancement and stuff like that? 